Thank you very much for the introduction, Amy, and very nice to see you again. Um, and I uh, saw looking at the uh, list of participants, there are a few former colleagues, a few former students, but uh, most impressively, a whole whack of people I don't know. So uh, look forward to hopefully telling you something um, that's, that's helpful in your respective uh, jurisdictions and responsibilities. The, my chat really is divided into three chunks. Um, a section I recall the before the country sideline, and then a section about creating the country sideline, and then really lessons learned from living and working with the country sideline. So when I go back to the 1985-1995 uh, uh, regional official policy plans, um, they had a line um, which effectively became the countryside line and they are referred to as the city uh, urban area and township urban area boundaries. And they demarcated the area within which uh, municipal councils could consider uh, official plan amendments for uh, urban uses, basically. Uh, anything beyond that line, out to and including the municipal boundary, those areas were agricultural of one kind or another and had that kind of designation. Some of those areas were also um, designated for um, natural heritage features, forests and, and, and so forth. And these boundaries were there to help guide when we would expand and how we would expand our urban boundaries to accommodate growth and development as required. And what we found was the, the boundaries are very hard to explain to most stakeholders. They're very bureaucratic and technical sounding. And um, when you got into the, the details of how they actually operated, how you would consider a potential expansion to, to a boundary, um, it, it became very full of planneries and you, you lost a lot of people in, in that regard. But perhaps more, more importantly um, for the people who were working in planning was that the boundaries weren't particularly hard to, to move. And one of the reasons that the boundaries were, were relatively uh, easy to, to expand and adjust uh, outwards was that at the time, um, we, uh, regional council was not a uh, directly elected regional council. And so you had a, a situation where local councillors would vote for, you know, getting their share, their uh, municipalities, traditional share of population and employment growth. And um, accompanied by that, we didn't have any direction about how any justification studies about whether you needed to expand a boundary. We didn't have any guidelines or any rules about how those studies should be undertaken, what should be included, what could, should not be included. Um, and we also did not have any overall regional jurisdiction for um, doing those studies, it was region's responsibility to, uh, if you will, approve or consider those studies, but uh, each of those studies could be undertaken by either a private sector developer or by municipalities, uh, with the result that you got quite a hodgepodge of stuff coming, coming your way, uh, and almost always with the support of the relevant local municipalities saying we'd like to expand, and so typically you got that kind of expansion. The other thing that uh, is important here, um, and <clears throat> I think it's, it's a, um, an important thing because it, it hasn't changed to my knowledge now, and that is the prime agricultural designation, which is very common. I think most people on this call today are from, from Ontario. The, the prime agricultural designation, the way the policy framework works is basically if the land area that you're dealing with is relatively flat, it's got good soils in class one, one to four, um, and you've got a, a fairly large, consistent, contiguous area of agricultural operations, well, then you're prime agricultural. And if you go to what was at one time was called non-prime and then became known as rural, which was you know, the lesser quality land, what you found underneath that designation is that those were the areas that had steep slopes, unstable soils, um, maybe lots of forests, or lots of wetlands, that kind of thing. And when you dig down through the provincial, regional, 
and policy frameworks, you find out that a lot of the lands that are under non-prime, you cannot develop. There is a, you cannot develop, you know, in a provincially significant wetland, for example, or a provincially significant woodland. And when you looked at the policy framework under um, prime agricultural, what you found is, well, if you've looked at the, the, the non-prime areas and you can't develop there, you can't you know, make, a, make a good argument for developing there, then you can look at prime. And what we've really came to realize was that notwithstanding that pretty much everybody, I think ourselves included as staff, we thought designating something as prime meant that's the stuff you don't touch. And it turned out to almost be the inverse of that. It was much easier to make an argument about developing on prime land than non-prime. And most of the land around our township urban area and um, city urban area boundaries was in fact prime. So we didn't have this, this strong policy protection on the other side of the line. And you need to remember that uh, through the 80s and 90s was a very different time in terms of the type of growth, type of economy, um, the demographic profile of our, of our communities and so on. But the reality that I believe in 1995, the regional, 1995 regional official policies plan had a 5% residential intensification target and no intensification target for employment. That seems absolutely bizarre to hear now, but in the day, it reflected the realities of, of, the, of the day very, very much. And you, know, you didn't have people wanting to live downtown. You didn't have businesses wanting to be downtown. You didn't have uh, folks who wanted to you know, move into old rubber factories and footwear factories and, and so forth and so on. So a very different time and very different circumstances. So in 2020, um, regional council was elected on a directly elected basis, which meant that you now had members of, of the community when they were voting for their councillors, they would vote for local municipal councillors as they always did. But rather than having some of those assigned to, you know, by that council to represent them at regional council, the upper tier council, along with the mayors from those communities, uh, people now had on their on their ballot slips representatives from the communities who were explicitly elected to a regional council. And this was the first time, and I believe it's still the case that in, among the, the regions in Ontario, I think Waterloo is still the only place that elects their councillors this way. But the, the, that seemingly simple uh, change yielded a big shift in what our uh, council, how it operated and what it wanted to do. And the regional chair at the time, Mr. Ken Sealing, uh, he took that opportunity and he put forward a, a view that council uh, adopted unanimously that they wanted to create a plan for smart growth in our, in our, uh, <clears throat> in our community. And that this plan of smart growth um, ultimately led to the creation of the, of the what we call the Regional Growth Management Strategy, strategy or the RGMS. And I'm going to pull up the original RGMS map now. And I'm hoping everyone can see that. Any nods? Yes? Okay, this map was from 2003 when the strategy was completed. It was begun in, in uh, 2001 and uh, adopted unanimously by council in 2003. And you'll see the countryside line there is what we jokingly referred to as looking like the unofficial hedge. It's that green fuzzy thing that wraps itself around the cities of uh, Waterloo, Kitchener and Cambridge. And then you can see smaller hedges around some of the, the smaller rural municipalities. And that was one of the, the key elements to the growth management strategy. Basically what it was saying was, we don't want to continue to grow on the basis of incrementally giving or having growth occur in each municipality, simply because they used to get a share of um, forecast growth. We want to grow in areas where it makes the most sense to grow. And that included both you know, from an intensification perspective, um, you know, whether it was downtown, older, older uh, industrial areas, older neighborhoods that were 
you know, not in the best of shape or there were vacant lots, uh, you know, old, older um, commercial strips and things like that. We had lots of these places that were very much underutilized. So that was another element of it. And then we also recognized, and you can see kind of a light green uh, area there, and you can see it's sort of the largest part out by the Waterloo Regional Airport on the right side of the, uh, the regional blob there, if you will. And those are areas inside the countryside line where we said these are areas that were continue, going to continue to allow suburban development to occur. And at this point, we're talking about 2031. Um, the boundary out on the east side of the community, out by the airport, uh, that was really uh, taking us well past 2031. We also needed to recognize that much of the infrastructure that we rely on to service any kind of growth and development, a lot of that has you know 50 to 100 year lifespan. And a lot of it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 years to plan and build and implement. So this was the basic thrust, and you can see the orange area through the middle uh, was an intensification area, or pr uh, priority reurbanization area, as we called it. And this ultimately was the area that was going to support what, over time, became the uh, the ION, our um, rapid uh, transit system. So that's you know the regional growth management strategy in a nutshell. The thing about the growth management strategy is that it it was not a legal document. It was a strategy meant to inform the development of the official plan, which we eventually got around to in uh, 2006. So I'll stop sharing that and bring up that's not sharing. Oops. Wait a minute. You can tell I practice. Okay. Okay, what you're seeing now is map four from the regional plan that was adopted by our council in 2006. Uh, sorry, started, we started work on it in 2006, it was adopted in 2009. Ultimately, most of it was approved. Um, by the province in 2015. And here you can see what is a very important element of the countryside line. You, you don't really see the countryside line here at all, but what you see is that on the other side of that countryside line, so in the areas that were used to be just prime agricultural and um, rural, we've now developed a lot of science-based environmental designations that support, provide much more additional support to the, the whole argument that you should not cross that line and go into these areas. So you'll see that, for example, we have environmentally sensitive landscapes, which I would urge you, if you ever do something like this, make sure you think about what the, the uh, contraction of that is. And we've got more people looking up uh, English as a second language while looking up environmentally sensitive landscapes than uh, you can shake a stick at. But that was our first element of really expanding the scale of some of our environmental uh, designations and, and taking a much, much more integrated and, and landscape level view. You'll also see here that we have uh, regional recharge areas. Um, regional of Waterloo, um, depending on who you ask and when you ask them, receives somewhere between 70 and 80% of its water supply is from groundwater sources most of which originate on the west side of the region. And a lot of the wells are on that side of the region as well. Um, but those, those aquifers that are out there, probably more importantly than, than the water supply to the region, is they account for an awful lot of the base flow in the Grand River watershed south of the uh, region of Waterloo. So they're critical to the, the volume, the temperature, the rate of flow, um, the water quality, and then obviously that influences you know, the ecosystem as a whole. So that became another one of the things that we used to say, on the other side of this hedge, this line that really, for most part, has always been there. There, isn't that, there are more reasons why you can't go across and they're defensible. And 
the last one that I want to show you is this map of the the uh, the countryside again from the the plan that was was ultimately uh, adopted by council and here you see that you see the the countryside line now in, in beautiful brown as opposed to beautiful green um, but what you see is when you, you take the prime agricultural the rural um, land use designations you add on the regional recharge you add on the ESLs and you put that together and acknowledge that the province have been working and moving forward with their work on the Greenbelt strategy and the growth plan and so forth. We piggybacked some of the, the idea of the protected countryside and the rationale that the province had used to get that into place. And we came up with our own version of protected countryside. And you can see the importance of the regional recharge area and the rural areas that really are key to providing a very solid science-based rationale for not going beyond that, that line. So in terms of um, lessons learned, what I'd say is that we found that moving the, changing the terminology worked wonders. People understood countryside line much more than they understood the, the uh, township urban area boundary, for example. They also understood the hedge as opposed to a line on a map. So we started to have much better ability to communicate with uh, all kinds of stakeholders in our community. Um, it only works if you have a strong policy environment that favors intensification and mixed use development and so forth. Um, inside the line and you, you have you know, new transportation policies that are different targets for um, walking, cycling, transit and so forth. And you've got these science-based policies and designations on the other side of the line that help fortify that line, if you will. So those are some of the things that are, are important. Um, I think the other things that we, we recognize was that the messaging that came out of the growth management strategy fundamentally shifted conversation in the development community and in the community at large before it, the countryside line ever even got into an approved state, really, in 2015. Everybody was treating it like this line that you can't go across, even though it didn't have that legal um, uh, basis that everyone seemed to ascribe to it. Uh, and I think the, the one of the lessons that we also learned is that while, and I need to be very clear about this, at the time we did this, there wasn't a, a really a very strong conversation about climate change in any way, shape or form uh, in the community, amongst academics, among planners. Uh, it, it was just starting. And people saw that the countryside line could be connected to a lot of you know, current and contemporary uh, climate change kinds of arguments. Um, but the one thing we've also had to recognize is that um, the countryside line, if it, gets, if it gets interpreted as being really rigid and un unmovable, and if you have what some people think are perhaps unattainable or um, very difficult to attain goals for intensification or competition heats up so much, uh, it's very you know, difficult to, to find lots to build on or to you get a planning process that's too complicated, um, you get things like very high housing costs. Uh, you get things like, you know, more issues on the issue of uh, homelessness and affordable housing. Uh, you do get additional transportation issues. Uh, you do get unrealistic expectations about what the country south line can actually do. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done um, to fully understand the implications of, you know, something which I think has been a great success and very proud of, but um, I think was mentioned in the couple of the previous um, presentations, it's the unintended consequences of even the best planning actions that very often come back to not haunt us so much, but require us to be diligent and be, be mindful of, of changing circumstances. And so I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much.